And I realize that I have weaknesses, but I also have strengths. I do make mistakes, but I'm not all a mistake. And I mean, it took me a long time to really get that. I would go and stand in the mirror and point at myself and say, God loves you. Wow. God loves you. And because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't love people, I kept hearing as a Christian I needed to love people, and I just was not a very loving person. All of us have found ourselves in these kind of really difficult situations. And Abigail, I think, is reminding not only David, but us, we've got to go back and trace God's hand of faithfulness. If we can't see God's faithfulness in our circumstances today, we've got to trace God's hand of faithfulness and start preaching a message to ourselves. God did it before and He will do it again. Those things that are hurtful, those things that I feel like I'm not forgiving people, I, I just imagine it like a, I've had to actually a bouquet of, of, of helium balloons and I literally, I put that hurt that offense, wow. those things that are bothering me. And I literally, I just imagine them that I'm putting it in that balloon and I, I literally just hold my hand out and I just say, God, you know what? I'm giving this to you. The story of Abigail is found in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And um, the scriptures start out introducing us to Abigail's husband. And I love the Hebrew pronunciation <laughs> of his name. It's Naval. So just say it with me, Naval. Naval. <laughs> and it just makes you feel kind of the truth of his character yeah. because the scriptures say that he was mean and surly in his dealings. Mm. And it also, t there's some clues in there as well that says that he was so hard-hearted, no one could even talk to him. Mm. So I don't think he was just mean and surly and hard-hearted in his business dealings. I think he brought that home as well. Mm -hmm. So Abigail has certain realities of her life. She's married to this man that's very difficult. She, uh, so that's a burden. She also has blessings because her husband's very wealthy. So we find that out in scripture as well. But she also has busyness. It's about to be festival season when we find her in 1 Samuel 25. So she's very busy. You know, the girl has been on Pinterest. She's got some <laughs> lists, right, of all the things that she needs to do to prepare for the festival. So David comes on the scene. Now David is uh, the, the one that we read about in the Bible with um, David and Goliath and all of that. Now at the point that we find David interacting with Naval and Abigail, he has been anointed to be the future king, but he has not yet been appointed to take the throne. So currently when we find him in 1 Samuel 25, David has been running for his life from Saul, who's the existing king sitting on the throne. So David's been hiding in caves. And it's very interesting to me as I study David's life, uh, understanding that he probably at this point was very, very confused and maybe even feeling mm. slightly rejected by God mm. yeah. because God had made such a big deal about anointing David to be the future king, but David's life doesn't look anything like what a king's life should look like. Also, David had suffered a pretty significant rejection. We find in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the prophet Samuel came to anoint the future king in the home of Jesse's sons, Jesse didn't even bring David in from the field. Right. If you remember, he, he yeah. passed by all the sons and said, is this all you have, Jesse? And then he says, well, there is one more, the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. Can you imagine when David walks in, in that moment, and the realization falls fresh on him. It was probably David's worst day and best day all in the yeah, same moment right. because he looked at his father that didn't even think enough of him to bring him in to meet with the prophet Samuel. That's a big deal to have Samuel come to your, your presence, you know? And I wonder if David looked at his father and said, your love should have felt like a security blanket to me, but it feels more like a question mark. And I believe in that moment, David carried a wound of rejection that we see come out in the story of David and, and Naval and Abigail. So what happens is David is at that point in his life where some men have gathered around him. We find out a little bit about those men in 1 Samuel chapter 22. These men were discontented, in debt, and disgruntled in every way. There's a fun group of people to lead, right? Yeah. So they, um, they'd gathered around David, and there's about 600 of them with him. So they have been protecting Naval's flocks, and we're not really sure if it was an arranged paid job, but regardless, he's done Naval a great favor protecting his wealth. So now it's about to be festive time. 
So David sends word to Naval, I've done you a great favor, give me festival food to feed my men and bless us in that way. And Naval's response to the men that David sent, it's very interesting. He said, who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Well, the men David sent to talk to Naval came back and the scriptures say they reported every word Naval said to David. So you know that when David hears this, who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? At that moment, I believe he went back in his past, pulled the hurt from the event of the rejection of his father. It compounded the rejection of Naval. Naval said, I'm not gonna give you food. Mm. And suddenly David went from being hungry for food to starving for revenge. Mm. And David says, we're gonna kill Naval and every man in his household. Well, one of the servants catches wind of what's going on, decides it's high time to get a woman involved. And so this servant goes and finds Mama. Abigail. The scriptures tell us Abigail is beautiful and she is intelligent. And Abigail knows exactly what to do. She's going to prepare a festive a festival set of food. She's going to prepare the food that David wants so she can meet his physical needs. But Abigail's going to do something much more significant for David. She's going to meet a spiritual need that he has in him with, I think, one of the greatest speeches given by anyone in the Bible. And it's given by Abigail, this woman, to this man. Now remember, David had a great destiny on his life, but he was about to derail his entire destiny because of a hurt, a rejection in his life. And I just wonder how many of us can find ourselves in that same spot. How many of us to navigate the rejections in our life, either we compromise because we're so afraid of a rejection or we derail our rejection because our reactions are totally out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And we forget, I've been called to a life of holiness. I've been called to a life of purity. When you're called, you're called to serve God with your whole heart. Well, David's about to derail his destiny because God has not said to kill Naval and all in his household. It would be a regret that David would sit on David for a long time if he did this. So many times I think today's choices become tomorrow's regrets, especially yeah. when our emotions get so out of whack and we don't let God rein them in. Well, Abigail goes to meet David and these 600 men. Imagine the scene. David has a drawn sword. All the men with him have a drawn sword. Testosterone is flowing. And David said, may God deal with me ever so severely if I leave alive one who belonged to Nabal and his household. And suddenly there's Abigail. Now, I'm sorry, but if I saw a man in that kind of rage with a drawn sword, I hardly think that I would do what she did. She comes and bows down in front of him in a posture of extreme humility. But Abigail, she was not only beautiful and intelligent, she was also so incredibly wise because she knew it's only in humility that she would find the opportunity mm. to speak to a man like David. Wow. Yeah. Humility was not a position of weakness for her. It was a position of incredible strength. And we would do well to remember that as well. Then Abigail speaks into David's life. And the first thing she says when she starts off after her introduction, she says, pay no attention to that wicked man, Naval. He is just like his name. It means fool and folly goes with him everywhere he goes. I love that Abigail says, David, your problem is that you are paying attention to fools and foolish things. Mm. And when we pay attention to fools and foolish things, we will bankrupt our perspective every yeah. time. Yeah. Abigail reminds David, you're gonna steer where you stare. And if you're staring at trouble, you're gonna steer toward trouble. But you've gotta stare at the reality that you are a man called by God. You've gotta stare at God's calling on your life and his truth and his assignment so you don't get pulled into these other things. I really believe our job is to be obedient to God. God's job is everything else. Yeah. And Abigail reminds David over and over and over. Another thing she tells David, your enemies will be hurled away as from the pocket of a sling. Mm. I think what she's reminding David of is, David, I've heard about you. Yeah. I know what you did when you had a sling in your hand. You charged toward someone, Goliath, that, that no one else in Israel would dare go against. And you had the courage. Why? Because God did that for you. Yeah. God empowered you. And if God has done it before, he will do it again. Yeah. 
And sometimes when we're in these really difficult life situations, like what David was in, hiding in caves, knowing God had anointed me, but my life doesn't look anything like I thought God promised me it would. Having this man reject me in front of my men and being shamed and, and pulling in the pain of the past rejection of my father, all of us have found ourselves in these kind of really difficult situations. And Abigail, I think, is reminding not only David, but us, we've got to go back and trace God's hand of faithfulness. If we can't see God's faithfulness in our circumstances today, We've got to trace God's hand of faithfulness and start preaching a message to ourselves. God did it before yeah. and he will do it again. Wow. And I think the story ends up in such a powerful way. The story winds up that uh, David doesn't kill Naval. He stays on course with his destiny. He praises God for sending Abigail to him. And Abigail has this funny little line. And she's like, and David, right before she walks off, and David... Once God has done everything he promised, remember your servant. Now, I don't want to make assumptions <laughs> that she was flirting here, but it gets a little spicy up in there because uh, God does eventually deal with Naval in a very harsh way. And Naval is struck down and he dies. And then David sends word to Abigail <laughs> Asking her to become his wife. Come on. It is amazing. And it says, Abigail quickly got up on her donkey and said, here am I, ready to serve you. <laughs> oh, I bet she did. So, but the story doesn't even end there. You know, it's kind of messy because David has some other wives and some concubines and it gets kind of like a bad sister's wives episode. But uh, regardless, I, I love the fact that her story doesn't tie up in a neat, nice bow because yeah. my life never does either. Right. And I think it's such a beautiful picture. Abigail, she could have played the victim card in her life. Sure. She, I'm sure, felt the sting of rejection. When a woman lives in a home where a man is physically present but emotionally absent, create, it creates a hollow feeling inside a, a girl's heart. And I'm sure Abigail could have played the victim card, but she didn't. She walked the path of victory. It's impossible to hold up the banners of victim and victory at the same time. We've got to make that choice. Yeah. And I love that Abigail took her own hurt and her own rejection, and instead of it working against her, she created this empathetic response to David and obedience to God that I believed kept David on the path to becoming the king from whose bloodline King Jesus would eventually come. Why don't we grab a couple of the subjects that okay. you feel led to do and jump into a subject that might be something popping out in your mind right now. All right, how about setting boundaries? Got it. Yes, I like that. You know, people that have been wounded, we either do one of two things. We either let people take advantage of us because we're so afraid nobody's going to like us that we are afraid to say no to anybody. Or we turn it the other way around and we try to take advantage of everybody else because we feel like we'll never have anything if we don't stay on top all the time. You know, I came out of my abuse very aggressive. You know, like nobody's ever going to push me around again and no man's ever going to tell me what to do again and I'm not going to put up with that and I'm not going to put up with this. Where I know another pastor's wife who was also sexually abused, and she came out of it like a little mouse. You know, she just totally turned in and wasn't very courageous at all. I was out of balance one way, she was out of balance the other way. And so, to be healthy for any person, no matter what your problem is, it doesn't have to be that you were severely abused, you know, different things hurt different people, and the thing is, is God wants us to be confident. He doesn't want us to be insecure. Yeah. So let's just say you're insecure. Well, if you're insecure, you need to not just say, well, I'm just insecure, and use that as an excuse to not live the life that Christ died for you to have. You need to say, I'm insecure, and that's not what Jesus died for me to have, and I want to get to the root of this, and I want to get over this. And so you have to start by setting boundaries for your life where you don't let people take advantage of you, where you 
you know how to say no to things if you believe it's something God would have you say no to. Don't you guys find that you have to have some personal boundaries for your life? Yes. And it's, it's hard when people are wanting you to do things yeah. and you want to be liked. Mm. You know, because I grew up not, I didn't have friends. I didn't, and, and I was, I had a real rough way of dealing with things because I was hurting so bad. And so um, I wanted friends. And so then I, I fell into, well, if I can't control you, then I'm going to let you control me. Mm. <laughs> and so I was always out of balance one way or the other. And thank God I've learned now to treat other people right and to not let them. I, I, I've learned to not enable people wow. to keep their problems. I talked about that at, at Joel's last weekend. You know, we have to know when helping somebody's really helping them mm -hmm. and when we're just enabling them. And so boundaries, I think, are important. And knowing the love of God is absolutely mandatory. That's, that is, if, if you are hurting inside in your soul and you don't feel good about yourself, and we need to love ourselves. And I'm not saying be in love with yourself. But you need to love yourself because you cannot give away what you don't have. And so God loves us freely and unconditionally. And receiving that is the equivalent of learning to love yourself. I mean, if God can love me, who's perfect, then I can love me. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I dote on myself and think I have to have everything that I, I want it just means that I respect who God made me to be, and I realize that I have weaknesses, but I also have strengths. I do make mistakes, but I'm not all a mistake. And, I mean, it took me a long time to really get that. I would go and stand in the mirror and point at myself and say, God loves you. Mm -hmm. wow. God loves you. And... Because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't love people. I kept hearing as a Christian I needed to love people. And I just was not a very loving person. I mean, I just wasn't. I was okay if I was getting my way. But if I wasn't, boy, look out. And uh, there was a lot of things that God had to change in me. But I really am like a totally different person. I still got some things that need to change in me. And I love working with God on changing what needs to be changed. I don't. That's not a problem for me. I know that his chastisement is love. You're not fighting it anymore. Did you used to fight it? Oh, yeah, I, because I didn't want something else to be wrong with me. Okay. I, you know, I already felt so bad about myself. That's why, actually, there's some scriptures in Hebrews, toward the end of Hebrews 5 and into Hebrews 6, and he said that you, by now you should be teaching others, hmm. but you still need to be taught over and over the same messages, I can only feed you milk and not meat. Listen to this, because you are unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness. So he was saying, I can't tell you what I'd really like to tell you, which was probably grow up. <laughs> mm -hmm. He said, I can't tell you what I'd really like to tell you because you still yet don't know who you are in Christ. And when you don't know who you are in Christ, then you have a very hard time taking correction from people are taking correction from God because it just makes you feel worse about yourself than what you already do. Mm -hmm. But see, now I know the difference in conviction and condemnation. And so when God convicts me, I know that that's him loving me. And I can say, God, thank you for loving me enough to not leave me the way I am. Be unoffendable <laughs> and keep short accounts. If you have those two things, um, you will actually move forward in life because it is amazing. And sometimes we carry offenses and we, we 
block a lot of God's blessing through the offense that's in our heart, through the bitterness that's in our heart. And God wants to pour unexpected favor, unexpected blessing, unexpected breakthrough. God can still part Red Seas. But if we're going to hang on to that offense, if we're going to keep accounts, I mean, some of us women are unbelievable. We could turn to our husband and remember something from seven years ago, what he was wearing, where he was standing, what tone of voice it was. And we remind, and you know, Nick is like, really, Christine, you need to get a better forgettery. You need to really really develop your forgettery and just because he he like he doesn't even remember that thing happened I mean my husband has got this amazing ability to quickly forgive quickly move on and it does lead to the freedom you're talking about the joy you're talking about the it produces the fruit of the spirit and I think a lot of times we're trying to get the fruit and God's going you know what you can just produce it if you would let go of this if you would um, ask for forgiveness and give forgiveness be unoffendable keep short accounts God says he takes our sins, cast them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. And maybe we would get um, a a lot better off in life if we remembered some things no more, if we actually forget them. I I prayed for a woman and she comes up and she says, I want you to pray for my, my marriage. And she said, my husband just doesn't do anything right. And she pulls out a list oh, wow. Oh, wow. Really? of all the things oh, he's done yeah. wrong. And I'm oh, wow. like, well, okay. <laughs> okay. You know, and it was written in different colors <laughs> of, of pen and pencil. And I said, why the oh, different colors? Gosh. She said, well, I may be somewhere else and I, I can't find the, a, a pen. So I just pick up a pencil. Oh, and wow. and it is true. That's people. They make a mental list, wow. maybe not That's a physical exactly list, right. but a mental list of everything wow. that someone had done against them. Wow. And so those are the lists we need to begin to make, to, to, to let go of those lists and let's start making new lists, yeah. it's powerful, you know, of the joy of, yeah. of the good things. Because listen, if God kept a list on us, oh wow, exactly, you know, yeah. we, we would be in really bad Can shape, you, imagine? you know, so. Well, we're all laughing at that. I'm sitting here giggling. Oh yeah, that's funny. But I, <laughs> we're all guilty. Exactly true, we are right? all yeah. guilty of that. And I remember we had, um, a few years back, um, had something just devastating to our family and it, it, the, it, it happened and then it went for for a good month or two. And for the next couple years, I'm telling you, when we went through that month, and it was in September, and when we went through that month the next year, Matt and I could tell you exactly what happened every day. Yeah. Remember? Okay, so this is the 12th. Do you remember what happened today? And you guys both heard it. I know you yeah. did. And then the next year, we probably talked about it again. And then the next year, maybe it got a little less, but then it finally, the whole month went by a couple years ago. And I remember yeah. waking up in October one day and I went, oh, September went by. Yeah. And I didn't think of anyone once that awesome? through that time. And it took a lot to forgive. And it was oh, yeah. like every day it was like God created me a clean That's heart. Right. Oh, God. And that's yes. all I could say every day because I didn't want to hold things against. And it was hard. You know, and I, and I love hard when I, I, love, I love hard. And, and so it's hard when you're betrayed. Oh, yeah. And it's unexpected it's by true. those ones that you love and are close. And I was so thankful because God does heal you. It lifted a weight off of you. It did. And it was, you know, and and it is your salvation when when you forgive and you let go. It it will just do miraculous things in you. And that is a miracle. Well, it is. And I think... The thing we can forget in the midst of it all is, you know, Scripture says that we do not war against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. And so what happened was you won the spiritual battle that that year finally when it was like I haven't thought of. And I do that frequently. I'm like you. I like hard. So I go there. All those anniversaries. I'm like, because, you know, it's just this same mind that might be quick. It, It can remember a lot of things, too. So when I and even just recently, I said to Nick, I just went a week. Mm. And then something mm-hmm. happened, and here's the power of it. I was watching TVN, and a, a, you know, a person was on, and something happened, and it was a year ago. And God does this because it was March a year ago. So now I'm in Israel, mm. and so I was in another place, and I was watching something, and that's when I saw something, and really it was like, whoa! You just 
told everyone what I told you. Like it was just a real <laughs> yeah. like, but, but in a really, it so sent me into a tailspin. Yeah. A year later of doing this hard work of going, okay, we're going to deal with this. As I talk about this chapter, so I want you to know that I can testify it's real. Okay, it's real because now I'm in Israel. We, we didn't even plan for this all to go where this has gone. And a different thing comes on, a different program. And a different thing that I said about a whole different thing, this person quotes again, except this time, a year later, this is how free I know. I burst out laughing this time. Like in the thing of that other thing sent me like into a tailspin of deep. I burst out laughing. Mm-hmm. And I looked up to God and I go, oh, I'm here. That didn't touch one part of me, you know, where, where it would have. For those of you that maybe have been abused or like me, you were left in a hospital. There was so much rejection in my past. So for me, my Achilles heel is rejection or abandonment or a perceived betrayal that would for me go back to my mum leaving me in a hospital, no name on my birth certificate. And in a sense, that was a, a, a type of what happened in that um, relationship. So that wound that would have went right back to when I was left in that hospital, you know, just um, born. It was like God wanted to do a deeper level of healing so I could help ultimately a whole lot more people. Some things you want to be delivered from, other th- and we all do, <laughs> even I do, but God says, no, sweetheart, I'm going to walk you through the valley of the shadow of death and you're going to find me in it. You're going to come out the other side, Christina, you're going to be able to help millions more people because what was a place, a, a deep wound in me that I didn't even know was there, but the enemy could have used it because ultimately this person wasn't my enemy. It's the enemy coming like through the them. Scab That's the getting deal. killed off and the healing never happens. Never, yeah. You know what I've done, and, and this is just, this is helpful for me and maybe yeah. it'll be helpful for you when you feel the offense or you you feel the excuse yeah. that's one way to to detect when you yeah. start making excuses you yeah. know why this person and why you're not here and yes. why you're because it really you know always ultimately comes back to us yes, it, it does. comes back to yes, your it achilles does. heel yeah. it comes back to that wounded place yeah. You know what I've learned to do is like I've learned to just take and I and I have to imagine it through my through my 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 eyes of faith or my imagination yes. that those things that are hurtful those things that I feel like I'm not forgiving people I I just imagine it like a I've had to actually a bouquet of 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 helium balloons and I literally I put that hurt that offense, wow. those things that are bothering me. And I literally, I just imagine them that I'm putting it in that balloon and I, I literally just hold my hand out and I just say, God, you know what? I'm giving this to you. Yeah, and I just release it to him. And literally I have released a whole bouquet full of wow. balloons to yeah. him before because it's a lifting. It's and powerful. you talked about it earlier when you realize you win a day yeah. without keeping an account. Yeah. You, you win a a week without keeping that account, it's a, it's like a weight lifts off of you. Yes. So every day, if we could just take inventory of our thoughts mm-hmm. and our excuses and just say, God, you know what? I can't do anything about this, but you can. Yeah. So I'm just going to give this to you and maybe it'll help you to imagine it. Uh, uh, you put it in your own helium balloon and you just hold it out and just let it go to God and just watch it drift up to him because you know what? He can take care of the hurts in your life better than you can take care of the hurts in your life. He wants you to move forward, doesn't want you to get stuck. And I think that's what we're talking Very about today. So. Yeah. Not getting stuck, yeah. not not taking on offense, not allowing the past yeah. to dictate your future, to define you. 